All right, at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Alan as we start looking at actually the results of, of this modeling framework that um, he and I have just described. Thanks, Ken. Um, we'll now go through and look at uh, the different system reliability results. Uh, but first, we'll start with some of our key modeling assumptions so that you can uh, sort of better understand the results. We'll look at example results for all those different levels uh, that we just discussed, the system response variables, resource metrics, indicator metrics with their vulnerabilities, uh, vulnerable conditions, and then we'll get into a sort of portfolio trade-off uh, comparison. Uh, again, we're just going to look at examples of all of those different uh, levels of, of results that we discussed in the system reliability framework um, as we go through this section. Uh, to start with, though, um, the, some of the key modeling assumptions that we made, uh, well, we started off by uh, combining all of the different supply and demand combinations and then modeled those as a baseline, so with no options or strategies in place, and then with uh, the options and strategies of those portfolios in place. Uh, we also had two different assumptions for how Lake Powell and Lake Mead uh, operate after 2026. Uh, currently we have uh, interim guidelines that dictate the operation of these reservoirs through 2026, but it's uncertain uh, how we'll operate them after that. We had two assumptions uh, that we used uh, the first being that we would extend these interim guidelines through 2060, and the second assumption was that we could revert to the uh, interim guidelines, no action, interim guidelines, EIS, no action alternative. Uh, when thinking about the shortages in the upper basin, it's uh, important to understand that most of the shortages are in the upper basin are hydrologic, meaning there's just not enough flow in a given reach to meet the demands um, in that area. We also had another shortage metric in the upper basin, and this is the Lee Ferry deficit that Ken's described. Again, uh, this is any time the flow uh, at Lee Ferry is less than 75 million acre feet. We report that magnitude as a Lee Ferry deficit. And we also inject water above Lake Powell and then release it from Lake Powell to, to make sure that we meet that 75 million acre feet threshold. Um, in the lower basin, Shortages are a little bit different. Um, anytime there's a shortage beyond what's specified in the interim guidelines or the no action alternative, uh, we don't assign that shortage to any particular state. So currently the interim guidelines specify shortages uh, for the lower basin states anytime Lake Mead is below 1075. However, in certain uh, cases, uh, Lake Mead just is so empty that it can't meet the demands below, below Lake Mead and so these shortages aren't assigned to any individual state or, or user. We also assumed that um, Mexico shared in shortage in both of our policy assumptions. As we get into modeling um, both the baseline and the options and strategies, um, it's important to understand how the demands above apportionment are handled. Uh, as Carly showed in the demand uh, section, there are demands above the current apportionment. Uh, when we did our baseline simulations, we capped deliveries at apportionment. So we only delivered 7.5 million acre feet to the lower basin states, except for under surplus conditions. However, once we started simulating with um, options and strategies in place, we would deliver more than 7.5 million acre feet if an option uh, such as a desalination plant had been uh, turned on. Uh, when we implemented conservation, we applied this first to those demands above apportionment. And any time uh, Lake Mead fell below 1050, if there were options that imported water into the system online, then we would switch this uh, imported water um, from going to benefit the demands above apportionment to benefiting the system. So we'd actually use that to help prop Lake Mead out any time it fell below 1050. Uh, when you combine all of the different scenarios that we had, the four supply scenarios, the six demand scenarios, and our two policy scenarios, um, it results in 48 baseline scenarios uh, that we simulated using CRSS, and, that we, evalu and we evaluated the reliability metrics across all of these different scenarios. 
Uh, due to the varying number of, of realizations of the different supply scenarios, this results in over 20,000 um, individual realizations for our baseline scenario. When you combine that with our four portfolios, um, there's, that results in 192 additional scenarios. And when you look across um, all of these 240 different scenarios, uh, there's over 5.8 million years of data that we simulated. So as we start to look at the results, um, we are trying to roll up all of this um, 5 million years of data into something uh, digestible and, and simple. And now to start with, we'll begin by looking at uh, the system response variables. And shown here is just an example of one of those um, variables. This is Lake Mead Pole Elevation. Um, I won't explain it now as I'll get to that in a minute. Again, the system response variables are pretty much just raw modeling output, things such as elevations or uh, stream flow. Now I'll move into um, our sort of dynamic workbooks uh, to present additional system response variables. And Tableau is just um, a piece of software that we used that um, allows us to display the results and kind of dynamically select which scenarios we want to look at at any one time. So Tableau, as you'll see in a minute, is, is really does just help us visualize the data. Um, it's sim sort of similar to Excel in that there's different worksheets um, at the bottom. However, it allows you to pretty uh, easily select what scenarios you want to look at at any <coughs> one time. Uh, so to start with, we're going to look at the annual flow um, of the Green River at the Green River Utah gauge. And to start out with, uh, we'll look at just the median flow um, for the observed resampled hydrology and uh, for the C1 demand scenario. And so as we adjust our filters here, you start to see the 10th, uh, 50th, and 90th percentiles of stream flow um, on the Green River. And to begin with, because of the way the observed resampled hydrology works in that each uh, future year is simulated with every historical year, you see a nice smooth trend um, in the data. And this is primarily showing the effects uh, that demand has um, on the system at the Green River gauge. And so you can see that as demands increase, um, we're getting slightly lower stream flow uh, going forward through the future. If you add on an, an additional supply scenario, uh, the paleo uh, condition supply scenario, you see a little bit more variability due to the way this um, scenario works. So it's not just a smooth trend anymore, although the, the trend in demands is apparent, but you do see more variability year to year. However, the, the, the percentiles are pretty close to the same as our observed resampled since it's, it's based on, on our observed hydrology. When you add in the observed uh, or the downscale GCM projected scenario, uh, then you start to see a little bit different information. Uh, there's much higher variability from year to year, uh, shown in this blue line. However, on the Green River Basin, the uh, magnitudes of, of the flow is roughly uh, the same as the observed hydrology. And this is, is consistent with uh, what we're seeing out of those GCM models as far as temperature and precipitation projections go in the, in the Green River subbasin. This won't be the case when we look at a different subbasin in a minute. However, before we go there, we can go ahead and add on all of our different uh, remaining demand scenarios and the remaining supply scenarios and sort of get an understanding of the entire uh, variability and the range of the flows that we could expect to see on the Green River, um, anywhere from you know a two million acre feet per year to, to upwards of six million acre feet per year across all scenarios. When we move to the San Juan River Basin, uh, we start to see a little bit different picture 
uh, especially in comparing the observed hydrology to the GCM projected hydrology. As you'll see here, most of the observed hydrology um, is quite different from the GCM projected hydrology, and there's a much more drastic trend in the GCM hydrology in this subbasin. Uh, we see that both at the 90th and the median, and that they're quite different. And again, this is very consistent with what we're seeing out of the GCMs and the uh, temperature and precipitation projections in the San Juan are different from those in the Green River Basin. Again, under the observed hydrology, you kind of see a smooth trend um, indicating the effects of demand uh, within the basin. And when you look at the GCM hydrology, you see more variability, but a reduced uh, median flow. Um, reducing the, the median flow in the San Juan Basin from around a million acre feet per year under the observed hydrology down to um, you know, maybe a half a million or a little bit more under the GCM projected. Moving on to our next uh, system response variable, we'll take a look at the Lee Ferry deficit. Uh, this figure shows the different magnitudes of the Lee Ferry deficit in the upper three panes, and then the percentage of traces that experience a Lee Ferry deficit in this lower pane. Uh, the two different columns compare the effects of the different policies, so whether or not we're extending the interim guidelines after 2026 or if we're reverting to the no action alternative. Uh, we'll notice here that under the observed hydrology uh, there's no instances in which um, we simulated a leaf fairy deficit with our observed resampled hydrology. However, as we get to other um, hydrologies, we do see uh, that under the paleo condition, we're in the five to ten percent range of trace. Five percent, five to ten percent of traces are experiencing a leaf fairy deficit in any one year, and as we get to the GCM projected, this percentage. Uh, increases. Here the GCM projected hydrology is showing upwards of 20% of traces um, are experiencing a leaf fairy deficit in any one year. As we compare the right, the left column with the right column, you'll notice that the, the policy doesn't really have a huge eff effect on the number of traces that a leaf fairy deficit occurs. As we look at the magnitudes, you'll notice that regardless of uh, what supply scenario the, the deficit is ex, um, occurring under, the magnitudes of these deficits are roughly the same at the 10th, the 50th, and the 90th percentiles. And this just has to do with the way uh, Lake Powell and Lake Meter operated and kind of some constraints on the releases from those reservoirs. The, the final uh, system response variable that we'll look at before moving on is the lower basin uh, shortage. Again, we're showing in the top three panes uh, different magnitudes, the 10th, 50th, and 90th percentiles of these shortage magnitudes. And in the, the lowest pane, we're showing the percentage of traces uh, where a lower basin shortage occurs under the two different policy um, policies. Uh, as we look at the later decades under the there's um, somewhere around 50 to 75 percent of the traces um, have a shortage associated with them and there is about a 25 percent increase from the observed hydrology or 20 percent increase from the observed hydrology to the uh, GCM hydrology and the number of traces that have a shortage. When you look at the magnitudes, uh, you'll notice that the interim guidelines magnitudes are, follows um, very defined benchmarks. Um, and this has to do with the way that the interim guidelines assign shortages. There's uh, particular magnitudes when Lake Mead falls below 1075, 1050, and 1025. So these different magnitudes are reflected at those different percentiles. Uh, when you start to look at the no action alternative, which uh, will calculate a shortage volume necessary to, to keep meat above 1,000. You start seeing a lot of um, magnitudes that are above um, a million acre feet as you get into the 50th and 90th percentiles uh, to try and keep lake meat above 1,000. 
Uh, now we'll go back into the presentation and start, and we'll look at the reliability metrics. Uh, an example of the metrics, not that of those 90 different reliability metrics. or excuse me, of a resource metric. Um, these are the 90 different resource metrics um, and they're all included in the appendices to Tech Report G. Uh, again, these are primarily raw modeling output and then they have typically a reference value associated with them. So in this particular example, we're looking at the pool elevation at Blue Mesa uh, for each month and each one of those red uh, lines is an elevation in which a a uh, boating ramp or marina would go out of service. In this particular view, we've for the baseline scenario shown as the green box, we've combined all supply and demand scenarios. And then the different portfolios are shown as, as other colors, again with all of the, the supply demand policy scenarios combined. Uh, the, the figures show the, the 10th, 25th, 50th, 75th, and 90th percentiles in the box plots and they show the effects that the portfolios have um, on propping up Blue Mesa. And so for example, in August, you can see that uh, at the 25th percentile in the last time period, uh, we're well below all of the uh, shoreline facilities at the 25th percentile. However, when we implement portfolios, we drastically increase that um, pool elevation and are above the reference value for um, several of those facilities. So we have figures similar to this for all 90 uh, resource metrics, again, that are available in the appendices to Tech Report G. Um, at this point in time, we'll, look at, we'll start to look at uh, some examples of the indicator metrics and the vulnerabilities, and I'll turn it back over to Ken to go through those. All right, thanks, Alan. So to begin here, we're just going to kind of review this idea of vulnerability and indicator metric. <clears throat> uh, vulnerability is a combination of usually an ind individual metric and some threshold to ultimately provide a resource-specific perspective on a system condition. You know, the example being, uh, if you look at Blue Mesa, as Alan was just showing before, how far do you have to fall or how persistent do you have to be below which of those um, recreational access reference values to identify a really vulnerable state. And then we can also present the results as percent of traces, meaning percent of futures that incurred this uh, outcome at least once, or percent of years, meaning across all the futures we considered, what percent of those years actually included this. And so to start exploring this, we've got an example figure here. Uh, this is Lake Mead falling below that 1,000 foot pool elevation as the vulnerability threshold. This is presented as percent of traces instead of percent of years. What you can see is there's three time windows, the interim period 2012 to 2026, a middle period through 2040, and then 2041 to 2060. Within each one of those three time periods, we have results broken out by our different supply scenarios. Demand scenarios are shown by different symbols, and our policy choices are shown by color, blue or orange. In the first period, you see there are no policy differences because we're always operating under the interim guidelines, the blue marks. Uh, there's really almost no separation amongst our different uh, demand scenarios. That's because they really haven't significantly deviated in their trajectories during that first period but that we do see some differences between what hydrology are you under. Most notably, the downscale GCM has about 28% of traces incurring this vulnerability at least once during that period, while our other scenarios are all below 20%, and some of them are, in fact, zero or very low. As we move to the middle period, we start to see some separation amongst the policy and the demand scenarios but still see generally that being under the downscaled GCM projected hydrology is what's driving the highest risks. Finally, when we move to the third period, we see that uh, there's actually quite a wide range 
depending on your policy and demand combination. For example, under observed resample, we see some combinations having 0% of traces, while others having as high as 50. And so that really starts to allow you to explore what are the futures and decisions that are starting to drive or um, reduce the vulnerability of this particular event from occurring. So at this point, we'd like to go back to the Tableau uh, tools that Alan started to show. And All right, so here we're displaying a similar figure. Uh, this time, instead of looking at mead falling below 1,000, which is a water delivery indicator metric, we're actually looking at mead falling below 1050. 1050 is actually an electric power reference value. And so we're looking at the percent of years in which Lake Mead falls below 1050, which is the vulnerability threshold for hydropower generation. Now, what we're showing right now is simply the baseline results, the observed resampled hydrology, and the current projected demand scenario. As we start to introduce some more hydrology, we see different colors introduced here. And what we can see is that the red being that downscale GCM is always across our three time periods the one with the most number of years vulnerable. And then as we introduce more demands, we start to see spread here. And color, again, is our uh, supply scenario, and demand being the different symbols. Now, finally, we can start to look at our different portfolios, meaning what we've done in terms of options implemented. So if we introduce one portfolio here, we now have two columns for every time period. And you see in the first time period, there's almost no change, meaning we probably don't have options on hand to deal with these vulnerabilities fast enough as they're approaching. And so the portfolio has very little uh, effectiveness. However, as we move on to our middle and latter periods, we actually see substantial savings in terms of the percent of years vulnerable. Um, most noteworthy, of course, is that GCM scenario where you're up around 65 to maybe even 70 percent of years vulnerable. And with the implementation of a portfolio, in this case we're looking at portfolio A, we can bring that down in the range of 35 percent of, of years vulnerable. Obviously, that's not an end goal or something that we want to really focus on as a, an acceptable or unacceptable outcome, but just that we have the capability to make significant reductions in those amount of years or traces vulnerable. Uh, to look at one other uh, result in this manner, we'll stick with the electric power resource category, and we will look at Lake Powell falling below 3490 which is, again, a hydropower generation uh, elevation vulnerability condition. And we see very similar results here. We see that in the first period, the interim period, across the board, we have low vulnerabilities. And that as we move forward in time, we see vulnerability increasing. And as we move further in time, we see the effectiveness of the portfolio increasing. 
uh, you see a nice scatter amongst the different uh, scenarios as we move further and you start to in fact see some overlap between the colors and symbols here in this third window. All right, so we've just looked at two different uh, indicator metrics and tried to understand how supply, demand, and policy impacts the results. However, uh, it's pretty challenging to look at more than one indicator metric at a time when you break out across those supply, demand, and policy dimensions. And so to facilitate a more broad-viewed analysis, we look at uh, all of the different traces aggregated together and look at uh, results in that manner. Here we're showing percent of years vulnerable by three time periods, but all traces, and then also percent of uh, traces, in fact, occurring that vulnerability. And what we're looking at here is the indicator metric for uh, shoreline recreational facilities. In particular, we can start with Blue Mesa at the top. You see that there's quite a few traces vulnerable, uh, 96, 97, 98 percent. And that's really because uh, the criteria for vulnerability at Blue Mesa has occurred in the past. And so if these elevations have been seen in the past, you can imagine that with increasing demand and possibly reduced supply, you would see them happening quite frequently, in fact, in the future as well. We also have Navajo, Flaming Gorge, Lake Powell, and Lake Mead as shoreline indicator metrics throughout the basin. So now if we go and we introduce a portfolio, you'll see Uh, that we have the baseline results and portfolio C here. Uh, the thing is we've shifted now just to percent of traces as opposed to showing percent of traces and percent of years. And what we can see is that uh, there are some reductions in vulnerability, um, not always a, a significant reduction depending on uh, the portfolio. But another interesting outcome is that if you look at the portfolio C results, for our, I believe this is Lake Powell here, um, you actually see the highest number of traces vulnerable in the middle time period, which is somewhat curious. But what we're believing uh, is happening here is actually that uh, in the first period, you're relatively low in terms of vulnerability. But as that risk increases, you may not have enough options either available or implemented in time to really bring that down, but by the time you get to the final period, you've in fact reduced uh, and brought on enough options to make a significant dent, and you see sort of that pyramid-shaped uh, trend in the percent of traces vulnerable here versus the just monotonically increasing trend that we see uh, under the baseline results. So what we'll do here is now switch to a uh, eco view, similar. And what we're seeing now are our ecological indicator metrics uh, under the baseline, portfolio C, and then I'll introduce portfolio B. And so the general theme is across both portfolios, we're seeing significant reductions in uh, vulnerabilities relative to the baseline. However, in some cases, for example, the Yampa portfolio C has even more notable reductions. Uh, this is due to the options included in that portfolio that are helping to keep more water in stream. And the reason it's so pronounced on the Yampa is because of the nature of this indicator metric whereby, for all intents and purposes, more flow in the river reduces vulnerability, whereas some of the other ecological indicator metrics have more complex uh, requirements that don't simply equate more flow in the river to 
improved results. They require specific timing and certain thresholds in terms of the volume and peak volumes. And so you don't see the same type of um, improvement on portfolio C for some of the others as much as you see for the Yampa. But we do see uh, improvements across the board here for all of our ecological indicator metrics uh, throughout the basin. Uh, last for this view of uh, percent of traces vulnerable, we turn to our water delivery indicator metrics. We have um, five of them here. To start with, we have upper basin shortage. Uh, we can see that uh, under Portfolio B and Portfolio C, we're seeing a continued reduction in percent of traces as we move forward in time. And to the point where in the third time window, we're going from about 60% of traces vulnerable down to about 28%. So about a halving of the number of traces that are incurring a vulnerability in that third period. Uh, we also have the leaf area deficit that we've been over. Lake Mead pool elevation, two types of lower basin shortage as indicator metrics, and then finally, uh, lower basin states demand above apportionment. And as Alan mentioned, under the baseline, we did not deliver to demands above apportionment with the exception of surplus years. And as a result, you see a very high number of traces incurring a vulnerability, uh, suggesting that there are demands that are going unmet that are substantial enough to flag our vulnerability concept. However, under both portfolios, uh, once we have options in place, meaning introducing water that we are allowing to be available to go towards these demands above apportionment, we see that they're brought down considerably and are in line with the other vulnerabilities that we're seeing across the lower basin. <clears throat> 